Good morning, everyone. Uh, so this morning, indeed, we're going to talk about, can we project the, we're going to talk about, OK. We're going to talk about sleep, of course, and what is sleep, you know, and you know, uh, how we do define sleep. And as we've heard previously, you know, like using behavioral criteria, sleep has been described in all animals that have been studied so far. So really using those criteria since, you know, the beginning of the 20th century, sleep has been found in all animals, you know, in vertebrates, vertebrates. So there is no one species that has not been carefully studied that do not sleep. Um, and this is the first definition. The second definition that, you know, is important to know is the electrophysiological uh, definition that, you know, uh, Michel Jouvet and Bill Dement in this room, you know, uh, established in the 50s and 60s using polysomnography, meaning measures that, you know, record the surface of the brain, EEG, you know, the voluntary muscle tone, EMG, the cardiac system, and of course you can have, you know, the eyes and the breathing system recorded. And, you know, just like, so this is Professor Craig Eller at Stanford that you may recognize, and this is how it is uh, set up. So this is really the surface of the body that you record. And you record that. And, you know, when I ask my student, you know, what it is, they're like, the brain. It's not. It's the neocortex. You record the surface of the surface of the vertebrate brain. So, and using this, you got the three main brain arousal states that are defined, you know, the wake the non-REM with the slow waves and the REM that is mostly distinguishable from wake due to the absence of muscle tone. Um, and so this is uh, you know, a definition based on the surface of the brain and how can you apply it to all species that we've been studying so far. And it's not so easy because this cerebrum neocortex has greatly expanded across vertebrate evolution to cover you know, the ancestral brain. So when people talk about the reptilian brain, it's mostly the fish brain that they're talking about, the hind brain, the hypothalamus, thalamus. But using, you know, those criteria, you know, non-REM, REM, wake, you know, those uh, states have been found in mammals and birds since uh, the 60s because they are very similar lamellar layered neocortex. So what about other vertebrates? Reptiles, for example, and this is mostly recent. So we don't call it cerebrum or neocortex, you know, so in reptiles we call it pallium or DVR. And it's only quite recently, you know, 2016, that the equivalent of slow wave sleep and REM has been found in reptiles. So again, very recent science. So that meant that biphasic sleep, or at least non-REM and REM-like neurosignatures could be found across amniotes. But of course, amniotes are not the only vertebrate species on this planet, right? Um, and it's actually the smallest part. So here you've got on this brie or camembert, you know, the, the blue represents where, you know, behavioral sleep has been found and the green neural sleep. So we don't know about amphibians, but, you know, my lab is interested in fish, so we look there because it's more than half of the vertebrate species. So it matters. So what about fish? So again, let's go back to, you know, nervous system evolution across vertebrates. You've got this big neocortex that we record in human. In mouse, it's thinner, so sometimes you pick up thalamus input. In fish and reptile, it's very small. So again, here we have a definition that is, you know, on the you know, least conserved part of the anterior most uh, um, regions of the nervous system. But still, we try, you know, so we use zebrafish. Why zebrafish? Because it's transparent. So imagine if you had a primate or human that was fully transparent, that would be neat. We have this with the fish. And again, it has a similar nervous system, similar genes, and we can look at the dorsal pallium, which is the analogous of the neocortex. So we wanted to know, you know, can we find, can we pick up, you know, like sleep signatures, sleep neural signatures in these species. And what we did 10 years ago is to use, of course, we started with hypnotics. So can we have the light dim? <laughs> Sorry, because it's as dim as it gets. That's a shame, because here, actually, this would be, can you just turn off the light? Anyway, uh, if you shut it down completely, it would be easier. But anyway, so on the left, this is wake. You know, the neurons are firing very, you know, desynchronously. While on the right, and we'll see later, it's the equivalent of slow wave sleep. So it's like using non-REM sleep in antihistaminergic. You've got synchrony and beaming, you know, of both hemispheres at the same time. Um, 
And when you basically plot those neuronal activity, you know, that has recorded with GCAMP, you can see that during wake, it's very asynchronous, while during this hypnotic-induced sleep, you have very nice synchronicity of firing of those telencephalic neurons, of those dorsal pallium neurons. So, of course, those, you know, those are just like pharmacology, part of the brain 10 years ago. So what about the rest of the brain? What about the overall physiology? Is it sleep, you know, not something that is an artifact under the scope? So can we perform polysomnography on a fish? So as I just showed you, you know, using GCAMP in neuronal cells, you can already have neurons equivalent of EEG here, fluorescent EEG. Because GCAM works so well in muscles uh, with calcium, you know, if you use a transgenic line expressed in the filet of the fish, let's say, the voluntary muscle of the fish, you have your EMG. And here we go. If I just run this, you will see the inflection and the fire, you know, the contraction and the firing of those uh, somatic cells, those muscle cells. So you've got your fluorescent EEGs, your fluorescent EMG. The fish being transparent, you can record the heartbeat as well. As you can hear, you know, it's a two-chamber uh, heart, one ventricle, one atrium. You can record it easily, and you've got your fluorescent ECG. They have massive eyes that are autofluorescent, so under a scope, you can also record them and see the saccades. So you have your equivalent of EOG. So... This is nice. You've got the, you know, a quadruple quintuple transgenic line to record all of this. So the next step was like, okay, you need a scope, a good microscope to do that. Whatever we had at the time was incapable of doing it. So we built our own light sheet uh, microscope. Basically, it gives optic sections of the whole body of the fish. So if you were to look closer, you would put the fish in the chamber here and a flat sheet of light would just create those optical sections that you would photograph, of course. So then it's just like you have the lines, you have the microscopes. How do you demonstrate its sleep? You know, how do you get an animal to fall asleep under a microscope? Whether you use mouse, or use mouse or fish, it's really not easy. So we use four methods, hypnotic sleep deprivation, wake maintenance, meaning, you know, we prevent them to take naps during their, you know, daytime. And, of course, spontaneous sleep after they get habituated to this microscopy environment. And the first thing we saw was this what we call slow bursting sleep, you know, meaning during wake, you have a very desynchronous activity of the dorsal pallium, while during sleep rebound or after histaminergic uh, or any wake maintenance, um, wake maintenance or spontaneous sleep, you can see synchronicity oscillation on off activity of those dorsal pallium neurons. Something else that was really interesting to us is that the more we sleep deprive the fish, the more of the slow bursting oscillating activities they display. So it was like, it was really interesting to see that they have some kind of sleep rebound homeostatic uh, process as well. So this is, you know, the fluorescent polysomnography of this uh, trait. Here we record the entire body, as I said, so here you see in this EEG-like where we do the entire nervous system, you can see the oscillation of the dorsal pallium. If we look at the eye movement, the eye movement stop during sleep. The muscle tone actually drops here, gently but surely. And what was really nice to us as well is the fact that the heartbeat goes from 200 beats per minute to 100. So, and something else that was really interesting is that the interbeat interval was very constant, very regular. It's slower, but still, you've got the same period. It's important because we'll see with what we saw uh, uh, another uh, signature that doesn't show that. So, because of course, people wanted us to compare that to what uh, has been described in birds, in reptiles, and mammals. It's just like what are the commonalities between this slow bursting sleep of the dorsal pallium and NREM slow wave sleep? So, first, you've got this synchronized on off activity in the cortex, dorsal pallium, the slow period, the fact that the, the amplitude is higher, the firing is higher a low muscle tone, no eye movement, slow heartbeat, sleep pressure dependence, antihistaminergic agent that induced non-REM in rodent and cats uh, induced this slow bursting sleep in fish. The only thing that we found that was dramatically different was the dynamics of it. It's extremely subtle. It's like 0.1 Hz 
you know, of uh, oscillation. And of course, people push back, which is, oh, is it non-REM, whatever? And actually, during non-REM, it has been reported that you have this infraslow band that can occur. Anyway, we can always debate about that. Uh, the second main signature that we found is what we call propagating wave sleep. And this is a little bit more, uh, how to say that, striking. This is an entire fish that you will see right eye, left eye, and you will see two waves of activity, a muscle one, and then this wave going through, um, you know, the entire brain. So we'll see after that, you know, it's more like the PGO waves, and after the propagation of this wave, the dorsal pallium actually is not oscillating. It's still synchronous as during wake, but it's just like there are some peak of synchronicity. We don't know what it is. Uh, and when we do the full fluorescent polysomnography of it, we have the following. So first, uh, you know, the entire uh, nervous system goes down. Uh, we've got tremors and loss of muscle tone. The eyes stop moving. This is the main difference with what people could rapid eye movement or paradoxical sleep. And the heartbeat actually gets down as well, but the interbeat interval is um, heterogeneous, meaning we don't have the same rhythmicity as we saw. And this was reminiscent of, you know, during REM, you can skip a bit. So it was another uh, interesting feature. So the commonalities between this signature, which we call propagating wave sleep and REM PS, is that you've got this desynchronous wave like, you know, activity in the dorsal pallium, total loss of muscle tone, irregular heartbeat. You've got those waves emerging from the pons that are reminiscent from the PGOs in mammalian brain. You can induce them very neatly with cholinergic agonists, carbacol, ezrin, like in rats and cats. Uh, and you can also block them with, you know, M2, M4 cholinergic antagonists, which would block REM in mammals as well. Uh, so the main difference, again, people were really surprised about it, is the fact that there is no eye movement or rapid eye movement. But to be fair, you know, when you do, when you score your mouse or your rats or whatever to do, you know, sleep, you don't use the eye movement. It's not a good proxy for it. It's really, you know, the brain activity and the muscle tone. And those are very consistent in the fish. So the main conclusion of that was the fact that behavioral sleep exists across the entire animal kingdom that, again, uh, we found even in the fish telencephalic and romancephalic neural signatures. And this is interesting because if you go to the literature in the 50s, 60s, this is how they would call it. They would not call it first REM and non-REM. They would say, you know, we've got romancephalic and telencephalic signatures of sleep. What it tells us is that most likely, you know, the way we define sleep nowadays is not something that is a mammalian-centric vision of it. It emerged, you know, uh, 500 million years ago with vertebrate. Um, so, so far, before this work, we knew that, you know, in mammals, in birds, and more recently in reptiles, we had those slow-wave sleep REM, uh, you know, signatures. So it's like 300 million years ago. Now, with this discovery in fish that is being, you know, replicated in other species, it pushed back to the first, you know, of course, those are modern fish, but it suggests that if it's not converging evolution, there was ancestral oscillation and brainstem uh, you know, uh, 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 dynamics from the beginning. And this makes sense because it's important to remember that the neocortex has evolved greatly, but the Roman cephalon and whoever has done developmental biology in the past of the nervous system, the Roman cephalon is one of the most conserved structure in the vertebrate uh, brain. So, so the work that was nice for us to show that, okay, you know, non-REM and REM-like uh, signatures are conserved across vertebrates, but what are the other benefits of this kind of methodology? Remember, we used to use C4, so immediate early genes, to find new cell types, you know, involved in sleep and wake regulation. What was nice for us is just like, because GCAMP is way more sensitive and is ubiquitous here in this panel line, we found a new um, cell type that was the very first one to fire at the beginning of the transition between wake and sleep. And those are called the ependymal cells. They are really, you know, at the interface between the brain and the CSF. They also beat the fluid around. And so that was really interesting. And we had another finding uh, in parallel to this. So I don't know if you uh, can see this very well, but using a, a zebrafish line that still had pigmentation, we found that 
I'm going to play it faster. So here you will see, you see, you know, the midline activation just before, you know, the propagation from the pons. And you will see that the pigmentation will change. So first, those melanocytes are serrated. And as the wave propagates, they will get rounder. And then the wave has propagated, the melanocytes will become serrated again, so those dark pigments just spread out. And during the next wave, let's, let's play it. If it wants, it doesn't play, but it's okay, I'm gonna push it like this. It just, you can see that each time those pigments shrink and spread and just spread again, they shrink and spread again, they shrink. And so you, we had like a perfect correlation between those PGO wave-like propagation and the pigmentation of the fish, which when you're a geneticist is kind of like a dream, you know, when you have like a color associated to your, uh, to your genetic trait or whatever. So in this case, it was interesting to us because in addition to this ependymal cell activation, it was giving us, uh, you know, a link. So what is the obvious link between REM regulation and uh, pigmentation? It's the melanin concentrating hormone neuropeptide system. So MCH is a very intriguing system because it was first discovered in salmon. That's why it's called melanin concentrating hormone. It concentrates the melanin. It's a background adaptation system. And for 35 years, you know, because melanin, the MCH peptide was found also uh, in mammals and it was involved in REM and food uh, uh, energy hemostasis regulation, people were saying, you know, it's different. You know, in fish, it's for pigmentation. All knockouts in rodents have no fur of skin pigment, so it has to be different, right? Well, the problem, so let's, let's keep this, the problem is that people didn't do their work, you know. Originally, there was one gene found, you know, in fish, a one exon gene, and the mammalian one was a three exon gene. When you look at all the fish genomes available so far, there are two genes. One that is completely the same as the mammalian one. So the first one that was cloned actually is the one that was duplicated during evolution. It's a duplication compaction with intron loss case scenario. So it was nice for us to just look at the actual genuine MCH system in the fish. And I'm gonna spare you the detail, but when we do the injection of this MCH peptide, when we remove the cells, when we block the receptors, when we remove the receptors, what we have is just so the ICV will induce those ependymal cells, you know, the MCH system. And when, so this is a complicated chart, but let's say that when you remove the MCH signals, you prevent those ependymal cells to turn on and there is no pontine wave coming up and sleep is reduced dramatically. So anyway, the conclusion from that was like in addition of this non-REM-REM-like uh, uh, signatures that we found, MCH had a similar role, very likely, between fish and mammals. And again, it makes sense, even though we have a neocortical definition of sleep, the main generators, modulators of sleep, are all in subcortical area. It's brainstem, hypothalamus. So just the MCH system being in the hypothalamus, it kind of makes sense. So I think also, for Phil, what is important now is to I know it's gonna annoy people, but it's time to move away from a non-REM REM definition of sleep and go toward a subcortical definition of sleep, you know, to define substates rather than having those gross neocortical you know, definition. So this would be a first step. The second step is, of course, you know, we will define what is sleep when we know exactly why, you know, why we sleep. And there are many functions that are, have been you know, demonstrated. You know, there is a synaptic strengthening, there is a synaptic homeostasis, the metabolic uh, function, the brain cleaning, and also more recently, you know, the genomic DNA repair. And those functions have been found conserved from drosophila to mammals. So it matters to have, you know, a definition that is functional. So one day you pick a species instead of saying, oh, I'm gonna try some broad physiology recording, go after the function of sleep and say, oh, actually this is sleep, because we know it. Um, Fish has a part to do in that, and I hope it's just because this transparency allows us to do, you know, whole body scan with single cell resolution. So I talked about fluorescent polysomnography, but imagine if we could scan the body, but all organs, you know, what happened to the pancreas? What happened to the uh, guts during sleep? And so have a system level definition of sleep with cellular resolution, because the fish also, you know, the, the shy hypothe uh, hypothesis of Chiara was also validated um, in zebrafish. So it's a very good system to look at synapses and your circuits in live animals. 
And more recently, you know, just like uh, one former colleague and trainee uh, at Stanford demonstrated, like in Kara's group, that sleep is important for DNA repair. And you can image, actually, chromosome motion directly within the nuclei of the neurons of living fish. So anyway, I think this is where we are tending to go now to have a you know, more functional definition of sleep. And to, it's important to just, like, like most other fields, to leverage evolution, you know, to just like, take advantage of the diversity of species and conservation of sleep. So I want to finish with you know, Dr. Louis Leung, who has this very nice orange uh, sweater over there, who was the main drive of his story. Uh, and we owe him this very nice uh, cover. Yes, fish do sleep even in the wild. It's not just a lab thing. And tomorrow he will uh, show us in a flash, very short talks, how you know, this system can be leveraged to create uh, or screen uh, new hypnotic drugs. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Philippe. Do we have uh, questions for this uh, very exciting uh, science about sleep and fish? Yeah, what's the point of the pigment changing? Is, is, there, is there some functional basis for those pigment changes? So we don't know exactly. Wow. What most people who have like fish tanks at home, they will find that you know, a, a lot of teleos are diurnal. And during the dark phase, they are paler. So I don't know if people have fish tanks, but you know, and with like those very shiny ornamental fish, when they turn on the light in the morning, most of those fish are pale. So there is like those two, you know, like you want to be either cryptic during sleep, or uh, I have a slide where you've got those chameleons that have this very, I think it's aposematic, meaning you know, it shows danger. You know, they become brighter during. So you can, because again, like Kara said, you know, it can be a very vulnerable and dangerous states, you want either to disappear in the background, which fish do well, or just say, hey, if you eat me up, it may not be good for you. Yeah, my Sorry. question is sort of a follow-up to that, is can you see, oh. uh, can you see um, either kind of fluorescent or light changes in the fish? You know, basically, can you monitor the REM sleep and just uh, in, in an unimmobilized fish using that kind of, using the melanocytes, the pigment dispersion? Yes. This is what we do, exactly. And it was the whole purpose. It took us 10 years, but we can do it. <laughs> but the f what is the function to have more melanocyte and more pigment, you think, in relation to REM sleep? So in this case, I don't know what is. It's definitely less in general at the end of that. So it's really, you know, during sleep to when the way melanin is regulated in a fish. In our case, it's synthesis. The melanin in fish, it's really the melanin quantity is the same, but it's going to be concentrated around the nuclei of those cells, so you make the fish paler. So during sleep, it's paler, so it's less noticeable. But you, it's probably to detect light, so is there like No, a I don't think so. There is, think uh, when it's, well, most fish cells are light sensitive. Uh, in this case, you know, it's just like, um, I don't think it has a function like deep opsins. You know, in the brain, those are like very epidermis uh, cells. Uh, their functions are mostly like ours. You know, it just, it's, a, it's a protective function from light. Yes. You know, UV radiation, this kind of thing. But there are other evolutionary concerns, like, you know, for fitness. You know, shows that you're bright and you're good, you know, a natural Looking. female. Exactly. No, so it's just like, so color in nature as, uh, you know, and pigmentation can be more than just sun, uh, sunscreen. Go ahead. Whether there is, uh, amongst the fish that may be MCH impaired, do you know if there's any increase in morbidity uh, in that population? Or so uh, I had this question before. They sleep less, half less, uh, which is surprising because it's not the quantity of REM sleep we see. So definitely, mostly like in mammals, it may have an influence on you know, the other aspect of sleep, uh, but their, their lifespan seems to be the same. To be fair, fish live up to five years, so it's not like we've monitored, you know, it's not like killifish that live for six months. Uh, so it's not like we did this very rigorously, uh, but we didn't see them dropped, you know, in the tanks, you know, like after one year or two years. So sleep deprivation, chronic sleep deprivation uh, might be variable, or they have, again, you know, this 
the way you cope with sleep deprivation may be different from a species to another, you know, like migratory birds or whatever. Maybe they have ways during wake to compensate that. Oh, go ahead. Do you, uh, have you recorded the PTO in albino fish or PTO treated fish? In these two uh, lines, there are no PTO. Ah. So the question is, would pigmentation be necessary? Well, you know, so albino would be like nacre fish and this kind of thing. Uh, actually, all the fish I showed you are albino. You know, all the, because when you want to do all brain imaging, even though I claim the fish are transparent, there is still some pigmentation. So we use a specific mutant where we discovered first, you know, so definitely it doesn't prevent you know, PG or RM, because this is where we found it first. In fact, what I showed is like, you know, one of those uh, experiments that were not supposed to be, were just like, um, Luis, you know, wanted to check that the transgenes were there, but, you know, it was not the right background, so we had still some pigment left. And it was a blessing because this is how we uncovered this, you know, melanin uh, uh, dynamics uh, strictly correlated with pontine activation. 